Okay, good afternoon. My name is Justin Brandon. I have the privilege of chairing the Committee on Resiliency and Waterfronts. I want to welcome you all to our hearing on the update to the Comprehensive Waterfront Plan, or Vision 2020. This hearing will provide us with an opportunity to hear from the Department of City Planning regarding improvements and resiliency measures developed along the waterfront since Vision 2020 was released in March 2011. We'll also take a look at what is envisioned for the updated plan, which is set to be released at the end of next year. In 2008, the City Council passed Local Law 49, which requires the City to develop a comprehensive waterfront plan and update that plan every 10 years. Vision 2020 created a blueprint for the future of the City's 520 miles of waterfront through eight broad goals. To expand public access, to enliven the waterfront, support the working waterfront, improve water quality, restore the natural waterfront, enhance the blue network, improve government oversight, and increase climate resilience. Since Vision 2020 was re released in 2011, NYC Ferry was launched, new parks and greenways were created along the waterfront, such as Domino Park in Brooklyn and Hunters Point South Park in Queens, a wetland mitigation bank was established on Staten Island, and the waterfront uh, navigator was established, an online tool to help the public navigate the waterfront permitting process. Much has been accomplished since 2011, but we still have much more work to do. What will the next five to 10 years look like along our waterfronts? A more, imp uh, a more important question is what should the next five to 10 years look like along our waterfronts? How will the updated plan address challenges the city is facing along the waterfront? These challenges include ensuring that any development is not only resilient, but also does not put those who live, work, and visit waterfront communities at risk. The city is facing significant threats from climate change. These threats, like sea level rise and flooding, will hit many of our waterfront communities the hardest. We need a comprehensive, resilient, and inclusive plan for our waterfront a plan that accounts for climate change, protects and enhances wetlands, ensures that all New Yorkers have access to the waterfront, and does not cite all heavy manufacturing uses in environmental justice communities. Six of the significant maritime and industrial areas, or SMIAs, are located in environmental justice communities and are all vulnerable to storm surge and high winds. Many are within FEMA's 100-year floodplain. Low-income residents and people of color living and working near SMIAs are especially vulnerable to the potential release of contaminants in the event of extreme weather events. We need to be more progressive in our thinking, for example, by incorporating green infrastructure in these areas, and we need to ensure that these industrial businesses are more resilient. We look forward to hearing the administration's testimony and answering our questions about what has been done since Vision 2020 was released back in March of 2011, and what should be included in the updated plan. The committee is especially interested to hear how the updated plan will address increasing climate resilience in light of what we know today about climate change and sea level rise, and how we can ensure that it will be given the necessary attention when a new administration assumes, an, assumes office a year after the updated plan is released. Before we begin, I want to thank my committee staff, of course, committee counsel Jessica Steinberg-Alvin, uh, policy analyst Patrick Mulville, financial analyst Jonathan Seltzer, and my senior advisor Jonathan Yenin for all their hard work in putting this hearing together. I also want to acknowledge uh, Councilman Ruben Diaz Sr., uh, who has joined us today so far. With that, I'll now turn the floor over to Michael Morella from the Department of City Planning. Uh, if you can, please raise your right hand so Council can swear you in. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Please begin. Thank you. Chairman Brannon, members of the Waterfront Committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this afternoon about the city's efforts to update the city's comprehensive waterfront plan. I am Michael Morella, the Director of Waterfront and Open Space Division at the Department of City Planning. In this role, my responsibilities include preparing the city's comprehensive waterfront plan pursuant to the city council legislation passed in 2008. 
that legislation required that the plan be updated by December 31st, 2010 and every 10 years thereafter. We are now underway in our planning and public outreach for the next comprehensive waterfront plan due by the end of 2020, roughly 13 months from now. Today, I'll share with you our initial thinking about the major themes of the next comprehensive waterfront plan, the extensive outreach that we've done so far, and the plans for additional public outreach in the next few months. Before I talk about the next comprehensive waterfront plan, it's necessary to discuss the evolution of the plans, as this will be the third plan that the city will issue. The first plan was written in 1992, was the first time the city studied and planned cohesively for all of the city's waterfront. One of the major recommendations to come out of that plan was the establishment of waterfront zoning, which was adopted the subsequent year in 1993. That required that waterfront public access at, uh, be provided as sites are redeveloped for higher density, excuse me, mid to high density residential and commercial uses. This important zoning tool has opened up miles of shoreline to the public that had been inaccessible for decades and led to the creation of over two dozen waterfront public spaces paid for by the developers of the adjoining buildings. In 2008, the City Council passed legislation that the Department of City Planning update the comprehensive waterfront plan by the end of 2011, excuse me, by the end of 2010, recognizing that the transformation along the waterfront in the roughly decade and a half since the first plan. The second plan recognized the diversity of uses along the waterfront and, as just as importantly, the importance of the waterways themselves. As such, the second plan highlighted what we referred to as the blue network, or using our waterways for transportation, recreation, education, and cultural celebration. And importantly, the plan also recognized the coastal climate risks we face as a waterfront city. The second plan helped advance the establishment of the ferry system, first starting as a pilot project on the East River and now blossoming into a ferry system that will service all five boroughs. And we started much of our coastal resiliency planning in advance of Hurricane Sandy in 2012. Since the last plan, we have made terrific strides along our waterfront. We've invested billions of dollars in improving water quality. We've built new waterfront parks and advanced coastal resiliency. We've built new resilient housing in waterfront neighborhoods and launched the ferry service that takes advantage of the waterways that surround our boroughs. But clearly, there is so much more to do going forward. As we start planning for the next comprehensive waterfront plan, we are guided by three overarching lenses, resiliency, equity, and health. As we navigate our planning process, these three issues are our Polaris, our North Star. Let me take a moment to describe the intent of each. Resiliency. As a coastal city, we face climate risks as we were painfully reminded seven years ago when Sandy hit. But as we move forward, we must dis discuss resiliency in concert with all other aspects of the city's waterfront. Equity. While we have made great strides in providing new parks, housing, and jobs along the waterfront, access to those parks, homes, and jobs have not been shared by all. In this next plan, we'll be looking closely at the distribution of these resources along the waterfront, and we'll re-examine how they can be more equitably distributed across the waterfront. Health. The health of our waterways should rightly be recognized as the cornerstone for the development of our waterfront. But health should also capture the public health aspects of our waterfront, including the benefits of active recreation along that waterfront. Now, those are just our starting point for the plan. The plan will be informed by extensive public outreach that we've done thus far and will be doing going forward. First, let me talk about the work that we are doing with the Waterfront Management Advisory Board, the group convened by the mayor and the speaker to help inform the city on the preparation of the comprehensive waterfront plan. That group was reconvened last year and we've met six times since, including a boat trip on a, excuse me, a, a trip on a tugboat in the past year to discuss various topics and potential elements of the plan. I'd like to recognize Councilwoman Debbie Rose, who has been an active member of the board, and I thank her for her, her participation. This past spring, on May 20th, the day in which we celebrate the 520 miles of our waterfront, we launched a broader public outreach with walking, tour walking tours along the waterfront in all five boroughs. And rather than issuing an RFP or a request for proposals seeking planning firms to help prepare the comprehensive waterfront plan, we issued an RFV, a request for visions, allowing New Yorkers, the true experts on the waterfront's needs, an opportunity to provide, to provide us with the, uh, their ideas for the waterfront. Key objectives of our outreach efforts are to broaden people's awareness of New York City's waterfront, 
highlight the fact that New York City is a waterfront city and enhance our relationship to the waterfront and our waters. We've held 15 events along the waterfront this summer, including our waterfront planning camp, in which we discussed various ish waterfront issues and learning about water quality monitoring from DEP and trying on scuba suits with the Billion Oyster Process, uh, Billion Oyster Project, to preparing go bags with New York City Emergency Management and designing waterfront sites with the Waterfront Alliance. We also had a Link NYC campaign running through the month of August throughout the city. Later this month, and through early next year, we're starting a series of five public listening sessions in partnership with the Waterfront Alliance. These forums are an important opportunity for New Yorkers to learn about and engage in key waterfront issues, promoting equity and environmental justice through our, through our waterfront communities and to actively inform the next comprehensive waterfront plan. We're also partnering with the New York chapter of the American Institute of Architect for a series of six public sessions that focus on different water bodies intended to provide platform for architects, design experts, and the general public to express their points of view and experience on the city's waterfront. We're also working with local planning graduate schools to delve into specific aspects of the waterfront, leading with the overarching question, what does New York City have to do to make the waterfront part of your everyday life? We are looking to expand this outreach to local public schools as well in collaboration with Brooklyn Boat Works. We are holding a series of meetings with various users on the waterfront, maritime groups, recreational boaters, to get feedback on them and their interests and their priorities for the waterfront. These sessions are tailored for the organizations and their members to have an opportunity to learn more about the comprehensive waterfront plan and again to share their, their input to shape the next, uh, to shape the future of the city's waterfront. Starting late winter, early spring, we'll be holding public workshops in all five boroughs, giving communities the opportunity to discuss their local waterfronts. Should the council like to partner with us on this outreach, we'd be eager to work with them. Excuse me, we'd be eager to work together. This amount of outreach even surpasses the outreach we did for the last comprehensive waterfront plan, and for good reason. All of this will help to inform what we write in the plan, as the plan ultimately is only, a valu only as valuable as the ideas contained within it. The plan is not binding on the next administration, so public support is critical for the work to be carried out beyond the current administration. In addition to the public outreach, the plan is also deeply informed by our work with our partnering city, state, and federal agencies. Though the plan is led by the Department of City Planning, this, the document is ultimately a reflection of the administration, which is why we are working closely with a long list of agencies, Parks, Economic Development Corporation, Department of Environmental Protection, Department of Transportation, Department of Small Business Services, uh, Department of Citywide Administrative Services, Department of Buildings, Department of Cultural Affairs, the Mayor's Office of Resiliency, and many, many more. We are also working with New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and New York State Department of State, who have provided us with a grant with grant to fund our work, including, uh, excuse me, who has helped provide us with funding for our work, and are discussing elements with of the plan with federal agencies, including the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. In summary, the next 13 months will certainly be busy for me and my colleagues, but it's an important time as we have the opportunity to shape the future of the city's waterfront. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, what are some of the, just zooming out a little bit, what are some of the biggest challenges that, that the city faces uh, along the waterfront? I'd say certainly, and this is, continues to be an evolving challenge for us, is, the, is how we are going to be addressing resiliency. The city is a dense urban environment, providing coastal protection is, uh, is of course a challenge. It's an area of the city where uh, we have oftentimes our built, we have our buildings, our highways, um, parks that people love, and rightly so, along our waterfront already. And so weaving coastal protection into that environment has already proven difficult and will be a challenge for us going forward. But um, our opportunity in the Comprehensive Waterfront Plan is to discuss um, what, what are the strategies that we need to use to, to help solve for that. Are there already are there already th uh, new challenges that, that we weren't thinking of when we first started thinking about this stuff that have come along as we're working on it since it's not due till next year? Uh, in our outreach thus far? Yeah. Certainly. Well, I think that, that 
one thing that has changed, I would say, in the past 10 years. 10 years, much of the public conversation was about public access. That, that would, I would say that was by far the, the type of comment that we heard most. Meaning frequently. more people wanted to engage with the waterfront. And get onto the waterfront, right. that's right. This time around, now, in the preliminary conversations that we've had, the questions of resiliency are often leading the conversations. Um, and so I would say that's a shift. It's not, not a surprising shift in many ways, um, but it is a shift in the nature of the conversation. Um, two of the goals of Vision 2020 were to enliven the waterfront with residential, commercial, and mixed-use development, and also to increase climate resilience. Um, what has been done to meet or, or address those goals, and can those goals be mutually compatible? And, and if so, um, how, how have you ad addressed them so they are? Yes. So I think that those goals, in fact, very much align. Um, that the question of resiliency in New York City has to start with a recognition of what's already on our waterfront. In New York City's flood zone, as defined by FEMA, there are roughly 400,000 residents living in what FEMA defines as today's 1% annual chance flood zone. With that large of a population, which is roughly the size of a, a, a pretty large Midwestern city, with that type of population, the question is, is how do we address what's already there and plan for the future? So the, the question is about retrofitting our existing buildings and our infrastructure, building new buildings that are made to be resilient, and building infrastructure that's made to be resilient. Um, and that's very much tied to this question of new development along the waterfront. And uh, through the work of uh, at the Department of City Planning in partnership with our other agencies, we have made we've made uh, important steps in increasing the resiliency of uh, of new development. Um, you could look at the improvements that we've made to the building code, as well as updating the maps that we are using to uh, as the basis for our uh, for resiliency as an important step as part of that process. So, say the past decade, how has development along the waterfront taken into account the effects of climate change, sea level rise, flooding? Sure. So, there are several things that I think first and foremost is building code and the maps that are referenced within building code. So, so what are some of the big changes that have been made? So, one of the big changes is that right now we are, the building code references the updated FEMA flood maps, the preliminary flood insurance rate maps. Those are a significant improvement by and large over the previous maps that were established. Um, that said, there is still much more work to do as those maps get finalized to make certain that they are a reflection of the risks that, uh, risk that we face today and the steps that we'll be taking to ensure that, that regulations are addressing the risks going forward as well. So you don't see development and climate resilience as competing? I think Broadly speaking, at its broadest, no. And again, it's in part because of the, the foundation on which we have to recognize the risks that we the city already faces with 400,000 residents in the flood zone today. I'll give an example. And this is, in, this is perhaps an important uh, point that we'll be also discussing in the, in the next Comprehensive Waterfront Plan, is trying to explain the city's strategy on this, um, which is that Building codes matter. That we saw this during Hurricane Sandy, and it's been shown time and time again with storms across the country, and FEMA backs this as well, which is that co buildings that are built to more robust resiliency standards are able to withstand the storm damage. And we, could we saw that during Hurricane Sandy, the distinction being older wood frame buildings being entirely knocked off their foundation, comparing that to newer buildings that were built to resilient standards that were able to sustain very limited or even no damage. And that was the case. You know, in the Rockaways, there are examples of buildings being knocked off their foundation, being only a couple of miles away from new buildings that had virtually no damage. And so building to resilient standards is an important strategy for the vast majority of our city, where of our city's flood zone, where we're talking about the risk from that infrequent, though growing frequency, that infrequent storm. I, 
with, with, with so many communities who are vulnerable living on the shore, um, do, you, do you think it's smart for the city to be encouraging more development on the waterfront? Well, I think that we're going to have the opportunity to, to discuss that, uh, both with the public through our public planning process as well in the plan itself. Um, again, I think that in, in a broadest sense, looking across the flood risk of the city as a whole, new development can be made to be resilient, yes. Um, what about the pressure put on infrastructure that more development along the waterfront will, will entail? How do we account for that? I think there's a lot in that question. So um, I will say, though, that that the comprehensive waterfront plan will also be an opportunity for us to discuss the infrastructure needs of the water, our waterfront communities. Um, is DC, are you working with EDC in, in drafting the plan? Yes. In uh, what ways? Uh, we meet with them on a regular basis. They are also uh, involved in the Waterfront Management Advisory Board. They're one of the city agencies that work closely um, with us in, in advancing the work of the Waterfront Management Advisory Board. Um, and so that asks, that's in many different aspects, in many different roles that EDC has, from ferry service to the maritime uh, work that they also do. Um. Um, would you support council legis when this plan does come out? Would you support council legislating to make parts of this plan law and codifying it? I think it's a little too early to say. Uh, insofar as the plan is not yet written, I think that there may be recommendations coming out of the plan specifically for proposed legislation. But at this point, it's too early in the process to. Say. I'm assuming DCP comes out with a plan. You're going to stand behind the plan. I would assume, yes, though I think there is a, there's a, perhaps a subtle but important distinction between things that are recommended and that should be further explored or further analyzed and mandating them immediately. Okay. Um, with regard to SMIAs, w will the updated plan address making SMIAs more resilient and, and how, if so, how? Yes. Uh, so. The significant maritime industrial areas are an important part of the city as a whole, um, but they are with the, they do face significant challenges. Uh, just about two years ago, the Department of City Planning released its uh, resilient industry study, which looked at um, how this exact question of how uh, industries along our waterfront can be made more resilient, and it's in some ways a departure from um, much of our thinking about resiliency in so far as recognizing that industry really serves a, performs a different function and that building walls and building um, new buildings may not be the appropriate response for an industry. And rather the study looked at what are the operational tools that can be used um, to make an industry more resilient in terms of storage of materials, um, continuity of operations for, the, um, for businesses, et cetera. And so I think the Comprehensive Waterfront Plan will be an opportunity for us to discuss uh, that work as well as, again, listening to the public and, and with the maritime community as well um, about the issues that they face. Do you know how many acres of waterfront land has been acquired by the, by the city as parkland? Not off the top of my head, but I can get back to you on that. Okay. I'd like to know. And, and and what neighborhoods and and if any new parks are being constructed on this on this land. Um, for sites that are developed under the, the the brownfield program, how many of them provide uh, public access to, to the waterfront? I don't know the the number off the top of my head, but I would say that as brownfields are redeveloped on the waterfront for higher density mid to high density residential, commercial, or mixed use for non-heavy industrial u uses, public access has to be required pursuant to zoning. So do you think public access would be expanded under the new plan, or do you think it should be? Most certainly, yes. Um, the New York City Waterfront Action Agenda outlined uh, 130 key projects to be initiated within the first three years of, of the Vision 2020 release. Um, 
can you tell me how the city included resiliency to these projects or give me a, a, a progress report on any of these projects? Sure. So the the 130 projects that were um, included in the action agenda were tracked for the duration of those projects. Um, within four to five years after the plan, we completed, I believe it was something like 97% of them. The other, I th if I recall correctly, it was two or three projects. I'd have to get you get back to you on the exact numbers. The last couple of projects that were not pursued ended up being projects that were rethought, um, in part because of Hurricane Sandy. Um, one of those projects um, was uh, was decided not to be pursued because of Hurricane Sandy. I'd have to get back to you on the details, though. Um, it's been quite some time since I looked at those those few projects. And how can you tell me how much funding went into these projects? It was roughly three billion dollars. Three billion. Yes. Um, how successful has the Waterfront Navigator been in in assisting applicants who need permits for projects along the waterfront? So this is anecdotal. Is that um, based on my conversations with my colleagues at EDC who prepared that, as well as members of the, uh, of the maritime community, as well as um, other uh, entities who are seeking permits, that they found the information to be quite helpful. It, um, it is a starting point for applicants, to be clear, though. It provides the applicants with information about the materials that would be needed for application and for, uh, for applying for permits. Do you have ideas or ways it could be made better? Uh, I think it's it's probably s it something that we need to look into again. It's been um, a few years since it was last uh, since it was put forth. Um, it would be it's appropriate for us as part of the comprehensive waterfront plan to be looking at that once again. Um, one of the things I've been thinking a lot about is the the time the the sort of timing of of the plan as it relates to um, the terms of a, a different administration. So the updated plan will be released by the end of 2020, a new administration will come in a year later. Um, how can the city ensure that the updated plan will be given the attention it needs by a new administration so you're not just you know, passing the baton to the next administration? Yeah. So th this is in part about is how we're addressing our public outreach. Because the plan is only as good as the ideas that are contained with it, we want to make certain that the ideas have public support and are generated by the public, and so that the public is able to um, continue to put pressure on the next administration to carry forth the plan. So Vision 2020 was released at the end of the Bloomberg administration. Do you, do you, did that affect the attention this administration has given to the plan? So. I would say that the the broad goals of the of the last comprehensive waterfront plan were continued to be embraced by this administration. The projects that were established under the action agenda again were continued and were carried out. Um, many of those continuing into this administration as well. So, in your opinion, do you think it would make more sense to? realign this so that the plans lined up with administrations? I think where we are right now is that we have already started this work. We've had a lot of public discussions on it. Um, but I think this plan being released at the end of uh, 2020 um, is the course we are on right now. I think for subsequent updates, uh, it's certainly worthy of a conversation. Yeah. I guess our concern is you're basically leaving a to-do list behind for the next administration. I think it's, you know, obviously we all need to focus on, you know, planting seeds for, for trees whose shade we'll never enjoy, but mm. this is also politics, right? And, and, and different priorities are different priorities. So right. the concern there, you know, I'm hearing as well from advocates is, is you know, this is like, hey, we're leaving. Here's what <laughs> you need to do. Um, you know, it's a considerable concern. Right. And, and the, the timing does lead to those questions. I would say, though, that the plan is is more than just a to-do list. It's going to be providing the rationale behind that to-do list as well. And so I think, should we do that job well, we're going to be providing a rationale that the next administration, whomever that may be, will be able to embrace and see the logic in embracing. So right now, how does uh, DCP measure or track 
the, the progress of the plan's recommendations? So th with the last plan, it was with the 125, excuse me, 130 action agenda projects. Um, we are still in discussion as to um, how to best uh, provide metrics for this next plan. So after Vision 2020 was released, did you review what recommendations were implemented? Uh, we have as part of the action agenda, as part of tracking so what, the action agenda. What did we agenda. learn? So I think that measurable results are, of course, important. I think that was one of the important lessons, was that that being able to track our projects and our progress is incredibly important, especially on something like the waterfront, where it does, by its very nature, require the, uh, the interaction and the uh, coordination amongst various agencies. Um, Vision 2020 emphasized people's active access to the waterfront and, and the plan tasked the city to create pier and bulkhead design standards that would enable uh, a wide variety of vessels to access the city's waterfront infrastructure. But since 2020, outside of ferry stops and the rezoned waterfront of Brooklyn, people don't have much of an opportunity to get in or out of boats or touch the water. Uh, in addition, some repaired piers, such as... Uh, Pier 17 in, here in Manhattan actually took away the infrastructure that boats use. Um, investments were made in my district at 69th Street Pier uh, for ferry access, but the pier is, is large enough to, to serve a variety of maritime uses if the infrastructure were there. Um, could you give an update on, on the city's pier and bulkhead standards that Vision 2020 plan to create and I guess describe how Vision 2030 can can use zoning and permitting and governments to and governance to ensure uh, we have waterfront waterfront uh, infrastructure that actually allows people to engage with it. Yeah. So let me start by saying that this is a topic that we're already in discussions with both our partnering agencies as well as the general public about recognizing that there is a strong desire for the public to get into the waterfront and through a variety of different uses, whether that be just large motorized boats, but also human-powered canoes, kayaks, et cetera, um, all of which require different standards. And trying to figure out um, what, I, what I would say are probably not design guidelines, but best practices to allow for those different uh, different users of the waterfront is something that we're actively engaging with, engaging on already. Excuse me. <coughs> um, well, the update the updated plan consider new industrial uses like like offshore wind power. Yes, the, the next comprehensive waterfront plan recognizes, is going to be recognizing and through our process we'll be discussing uh, the opportunities for offshore wind and how New York City can uh, best position itself to take advantage of, uh, of offshore wind. How can we connect the updated plan with the need for the comprehensive long-term resilience planning like in intro 1620? So, the Comprehensive Waterfront Plan will be our opportunity to discuss the city's approach broadly for resiliency across our shoreline. It's not going to necessarily get into the details of individual projects for shoreline for coastal protection. And I would argue it's not necessary that we do so at this time, given the Army Corps' work on the harbor and tributary study. Um, that said, um, by as part of this planning process, we'll be evaluating the work of the Army Corps of Engineers and responding to that. So I know before y you sort of agreed that development and climate resilience doesn't have to be a binary choice, but how will the city ensure that new development does not lead to fewer green spaces on the waterfront? Well, I think if anything, new development along our waterfront has proven to actually be providing green spaces. That in New York City, by and large, new development doesn't occur on, on undeveloped lands. It's a question of redevelopment, especially along our waterfront. That our waterfronts, uh, particularly those areas that were previously industrial and have over time um, been redeveloped for new uses, that's been an opportunity for us to provide new waterfront public access as part of that development uh, pursuant to zoning. Okay. Okay, um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We're gonna call up our first panel. Uh, we have...
Roland Lewis from Waterfront Alliance, and Michael DeLong from Riverkeeper. Start whenever you're ready. Uh, thank you, Chairman Brannon and members of the Resiliency and Waterfronts Committee um, for allowing us to testify on this on the um, Comprehensive Waterfront Plan for 2020. My name is Mike Dulong. I'm a senior attorney at Hudson Riverkeeper. Uh, we are a member supported watchdog group dedicated to defending the Hudson River, including all of the tributaries in and around New York City, and to defending the drinking water supply of nine million New York City and Hudson Valley residents. Um, I am here to talk about uh, four things today, why this plan, why the comprehensive waterfront plan is important, um, the outreach that DCP has done um, over this last couple months, um, some of Riverkeeper's proposals for 2020, and most importantly, I think what the plan won't accomplish um, so I'll start with the good stuff. Um, we support creation of these plans. Uh, we think they're very important. They've had a positive impact on New York City's waterfront. Um, they've created special natural waterfront areas. They've restored hundreds, or the plans have led to the restoration of hundreds of acres um, throughout the city of uh, wetland and other natural areas, creating habitat, um, providing uh, protection for ecosystems. Um, they've led to to the development of hundreds of acres of greenway and waterfront parks, as were just described. And the zoning requirements for uh, public waterfront access on private residential developments um, have benefited a lot of neighborhoods, including mine in Williamsburg, especially Domino Park. Um, and so these plans are good, and we expect good things coming out of this 2020 plan. Um, now, in the lead up to this plan, DCP has met with Riverkeeper to discuss some of the issues. They've been very open to hearing our perspective. We know they've met with other groups as well, and we are excited to take part in DCP's and Waterfront Alliance's um, public forums on some of the substantive issues uh, that this plan is going to cover. Now, I think all of those forums, or the five forums, are going to take place in Manhattan. We understand that other forums or other um, public hearings will be held in other boroughs. Um, it's, I think there could be a little bit more outreach in terms of all of the communities, um, all of the shoreline communities, and specifically of all the languages that those, the different languages that are prevalent in those shoreline communities. Um, the people that are there have the best perspective on what they want to see over the next 10 years and over the next 50 years on their waterfront. Um, we have proposed a few initiatives for the 2020 plan, um, specifically uh, flowing from our vision plans for Newtown Creek and Flushing Waterways, Flushing Bay and Flushing Creek. <coughs> in Newtown Creek, we've proposed 185 projects in that plan, and these are plans that were driven by uh, community forums um, and getting the perspectives, working with city agencies, uh, city elected officials, um, a number of groups on these waterways. Uh, and the, the result of those plans were proposals for street end parks, um, a continuous loop greenway on in and <coughs> around Dutch Kills up in Long Island City, uh, and restoration of Mass Pef Creek to a wetland. Um, up in Flushing Bay and Flushing Creek, we propose a bridge over Flushing Creek that would connect the community of Flushing um, with the Flushing Bay promenade. Um, along with a number of amenities on the promenade in the bay, uh, right along the community of East Elmhurst, um, which is starved for parkland. They need parkland park improvements on that waterway. Um, there are a number of proposals for green infrastructure um, and amenities such as better paths, tiered seating, et cetera. Some of the, we want that uh, promenade to look like the west side of Manhattan, um, or at least provide the same amenities that the, the people on the west side of Manhattan have. Um, we provided some wider policy recommendations, including, so the, the plan that allows, or the zoning that allows for public access in front of new developments is specifically for residential and that mixed use <coughs> commercial. Um, there are a lot of industrial waterfront properties that don't actually use their waterfront for anything. Um, think big storage um, warehouses, uh, other commercial buildings that 
even they don't even allow their workers in some cases to access that waterfront. Um, so there are many properties that do use the waterfront. Um, all kinds of shipping, um, trash, uh, waste transport, et cetera. Um, for the ones that don't use that property, they could develop that into a public space. They could develop their waterfront to be usable. For the ones that do use it, we want them to continue using it. We actually, that's a great part of these plans that they support industrial use of our waterfront. Um, and we had also supported or proposed a grant program for industrial sites that have green roofs and green shores. And we think these types of sites should be rewarded for um, protecting water quality and for the benefit that they're going to have that those amenities would have uh, for water quality in New York. Now, what this plan will not accomplish. Um, resiliency measures should be a key aspect of this plan, broadly speaking. Um, this plan will not develop uh, or it will not propose a way to protect all 520 miles of coastland, coastline. It will not protect all communities in New York City. It won't get into that level of detail. I do not think we can rely on the Army Corps alone to set that plan forth. And I think New Yorkers know how to protect themselves better than the federal government knows how to protect New Yorkers. Uh, therefore, we urge you to continue to pursue Intro 1620 um, and to continue refining that to develop such a plan or such a method to, to getting to that plan. DCP doesn't have the resources now and they don't have the time. Uh, that type of plan to gain community input, real meaningful community input, would take much more than a year and it would take much more than the staff that DCP currently has allocated to this plan. Um, I think that is a longer term effort and it's, it's a very important effort that can and should be done separately. Um, one other thing that this, based on other previous plans, that this will not accomplish uh, is improving water quality. Um, the plan we expect will again roughly parrot what DEP plans currently are to improve water quality in the city. DEP has 11 long-term control plans. It's, it has nine, but it's developing two more. Um, so we expect that this plan will roughly parrot what those are going to do. And not a single one of those plans is going to bring our waters into compliance with the Clean Water Act to make them fishable, swimmable, and usable. Right now, there's 20 billion gallons of sewage going into the harbor every year. That's almost every single waterway. You're talking Bronx River, Newtown Creek, Kiwanis Canal, um, down in Staten Island. So roughly, there are sewage discharges in the city on roughly one third of the days, making water unsuitable for human contact on one third of the days. Uh, this is gonna get much worse with, in terms of, or much worse because of climate change, in terms of intensity and frequency of storms that cause these CSO discharges. Um, and and so, that's, so that's happening right now, you're saying, why? Why is it happening? Um, so on normal days, the city has enough sewage treatment capacity to treat all of its sewage. So on a sunny day like today, everything's getting treated, it's going through a treatment plant, and then uh, treated water is coming out on the other side. When it rains, that capacity, our sewer system, in s under 60% of the city, mostly the heavily developed areas, um, the sewage mixes with the stormwater, the polluted stormwater coming off of streets, coming off of industrial properties, and it goes into the same pipe, and then it overwhelms the capacity of the sewage treatment plant. So there are 450 outfalls that dot all the coasts uh, in along the 520 miles of coastline, and you have raw sewage coming out all over the city in almost every neighborhood, um, except southern Long Island or southern Staten Island, where there are a lot of um, separated sewer systems. Um, so we don't expect this plan to get into detail to be able to fix that. And so we urge you to pass uh, Intro 1618, it's a sewage study bill, um, that will get into these issues. It'll, I, there, is, there are a bunch of studies in this bill. Um, one would be to inventory pollutant conditions in each waterway. Uh, another is to identify green infrastructure opportunities to reduce the amount of uh, precipitation that would make its way into those storm sewers and thereby prevent at least some of that volume from uh, overwhelming the sewer sewage system. It would study the impacts of chlorination. There's a proposal to chlorinate some of the combined sewer overflow and just dose it with chlorine and then let it flow out the other end of the pipe. Um, we're calling for a study of 
what the, what the impacts would be of residual chlorine staying in that water or chlorination by pack, uh, chlorination byproducts that might remain in that water as it comes out the other end of the pipe. Uh, and the last study would be a, a holistic approach to water quality protection. The long-term control plans look at CSO only. There is a lot of um, there are a lot of other pollutant sources, including 40% of the city has what we call MS4. It's a separate sewer system, uh, and there is a lot there are pathogens and there are other pollutants that come out of that system too. And so, looking at these things on a water body basis, as opposed to on a CSO only basis. Uh, might lead to some solutions, some good solutions for New York City that can improve water quality um, in a relatively cheap way. So these are, in this bill, there are not a lot of um, directives for the city to do things. It's the city should study things and come up with solutions that might be better than what they have on the table now. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Sounds like you take issue with the term comprehensive. I, th I think it would be impossible to do a comprehensive water waterfront plan that encapsulates all of these to the re level of granularity. And I, I think Mr. Morella said that in terms of resiliency, you could not come up with a plan for all 520 miles, specifically property by property, to look at how you're going to protect that coastline. Similar with sewage, I think it's it's a very big issue that wouldn't be able to get done through this plan because of the timing and because of the resources that DCP currently has. What, what, so what do you suggest? Um, well, I, I do suggest those two bills get passed. So what we're looking for are greater, wider studies um, of these. But do you think a different agency should be handling it? Um, the, the 1620, sorry, 1618 study on sewage, that would be DEP. Right. Um, they might have more ex a little bit more expertise in sewage specifically, although I'd hate to um, put them in a silo by themselves. There are a lot of other city agencies that can and should be involved in something like that. Sure. Uh, similar, it, it, it is possible that DCP should be in charge of the 520-mile plan. I don't think they should be can or should be alone in doing so, but they certainly don't have the resources to do it given what they have now. They would need to be provided those. Okay, thank you. Roland. Sure. Um, thank you. I'm Roland Lewis, uh, president of the Waterfront Alliance, alliance of over 1,100 uh, civic organizations and businesses, including Riverkeeper and many others, some in, in the room right now. Um, uh, I'll actually, I'm going to uh, finish uh, uh, I want the, the last, I'll, your last question to Michael, <laughs> I'll answer. I think one, one answer to that question is, uh, Intro 928, uh, the Mayor's Office of the Waterfront, um, a, a uh, bill with uh, 45 sponsors that I think might be able to. Uh, I'm confident we're going to pass that soon. And I think, well, uh, uh, I, 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 we pass it, and also I think it, having it being an independent body within the Mayor's Office uh, to, uh, right now, now there's, a, there's a question of whether it sits within DCP or if it sits outside of DCP. And I think outside is where it will have the mayoral imprint and a ability to yeah it should be a standalone there you go yeah. so let me get the, I'll get back to that in a minute but I uh, uh, just want to say uh, for the record and that uh, the current iteration of this comprehensive waterfront plan I'm, I'm very proud to say was started with uh, the with the council um, uh, former speaker Quinn announced uh, the legislation with working with us on our city water day event uh, um, back in 2008 um, and uh, I won't, uh, I guess, reiterate all the uh, um, uh, accomplishments that, uh, but uh, there has been, uh, I think, great movement within uh, the city, recognizing the waterfront as a thing, as a thing that each community ha has, sometimes on the negative uh, por portion in your district and many others, with the CSO uh, challenge, uh, but also uh, ferry service and, and uh, act access and parks, the things that people want, educational opportunities for the children at the water's edge. So um, we've had uh, uh, the ability, and uh, again, I'm proud to say that through the Comprehensive Waterfront Plan and the outreach that we did with, uh, with DCP, uh, sometimes at the beginning maybe they were a little reluctant, but the Waterfront Alliance brought uh, groups like Riverkeeper and many, many others into large forums which not only informed the plans with some of the best thinking as uh, you heard just a minute ago, but uh, from a variety of sources so from all throughout the city, but also allowed people to own this as a, uh, a document that they knew they had contributed to, the, the issue of uh, um, industrial environmental justice issue of, of uh, 
industrial areas being flooded in a, in a storm, which, which did happen. The, the Five Borough Greenway, these were ideas that came into the plan from, the, uh, from, from groups uh, uh, outside that uh, DCP adopted and went forward with it. So uh, uh, the uh, mitigation bank that we've been cha we championed is now a reality with Solano River Creek. Citywide ferry service uh, we also champion is now, uh, now, a, now a reality. Um, resiliency projects that have gone forward and need to go forward. I'll talk about that in one second. Um, the one thing you asked, uh, uh, Michael, about uh, the action agenda, the 130-odd items, one thing that didn't get uh, adopted by the city was a, a set of design guidelines. We, 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 we championed that idea. The city didn't move forward uh, with that. And uh, in partnership with, with the city and others, we developed the Waterfront Edge design guidelines ourselves, WEDGE, which has now been used by about 10 different projects up and down uh, throughout the boroughs to make waterfronts that are uh, more resilient, uh, accessible, and provide ecological benefit. So that, uh, that idea, while the city didn't move forward with it at the time, has become a re uh, reality. There's new access that we've helped to do through the EcoDoc program, uh, preserving wa working waterfront, um, the Red Hook Container Terminal, other things that we've championed. So lots of things that were outlined in the plan have happened with us and also just by the city itself. But as uh, I think we are, are here to talk about, this is not about accomplishments to, um, from Vision 2020. It's, it's uh, what we're planning for 2030. And I'll, I'm actually just going to re reiterate some of the things um, that Mike has talked about. I think um, uh, the, the resiliency uh, legislation that you're co-sponsor of, of 1620, is critically important. I don't think it's there yet. I think it's a, uh, it's a start. And I, I believe that um, we need to put a lot more meat on those bones. Um, I'm, uh, as we've discussed previously, uh, uh, we have uh, established a uh, resiliency task force and are coming forward with a campaign that will help, you know, mine those great ideas uh, at a neighborhood level uh, from finance, the finance communications, governance, give a roadmap to do things better, quicker, and w with communities uh, to uh, protect the city against the, the greatest challenge we all face of, of sea level rise. Um, the uh, uh, 1618 that uh, uh, Mike talked about extensively, I think, is another important issue that we have to do. Building code uh, revisions, um, maritime investment to create, uh, as you're probably aware, uh, um, UPS is creating a facility in Red Hook. There's no place for them to do roll on, roll off uh, along the Manhattan shoreline, so those trucks still have to run around to get over the bridges. We can move so much goods by the uh, uh, by the water. So that's the, the real most important thing. I'll finish where I started, um, which is uh, governance. Uh, how do we make this happen? Uh, I, I commend DCP for the job they've been doing and, and they with the, the resources they have, but they're, they're, uh, they, it is limited. Uh, we need, uh, you know, te you go 10 years back, we weren't thinking about wind power, were we? You know, we weren't thinking about the severity. We knew sea level rise was an issue, but we weren't, we, we didn't understand the severity and it's gotten worse. And it's great that we focus every 10 years to take a deep, uh, a deep dive and look at it, but those years two through nine <laughs> need management, right? We need to uh, be able to nimbly uh, attack problems as they arise, uh, 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 you know, grab opportunities as they arise, uh, as, as we're doing with wind power right now. So I believe that Mayor's Office of the Waterfront is a great step in that direction. It'll give um, mayoral clout to um, uh, attack these critical issues, this, this committee, and most importantly, I think, the, that, that of resiliency. Uh, we are truly at the precipice of adapting and perhaps changing the way the city looks, functions, um, and uh, operates uh, for generations to come. And if we do it right, our children and grandchildren will thank us. If we do it wrong, um, pox in our house. Thank you very much. Um, I would just ask, I guess in closing, what are, uh, this, the same thing I asked the, the administration, what, what are some of the biggest challenges you think the city faces along the waterfront? Um, at, at the risk of repetition, it, it, it's, it's what, how we build and protect uh, neighbors and if we build, the trade-offs. Right. Um, that we're I mean, we're do you, like I, I, same, I pose to you what I pose to DCP, do you think we should be encouraging more development along the waterfront? I, I, I think we have to think twice about certain areas. There, 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 there are places where um, if the um, projections uh, are, are correct, and the, the, the problem with the projections as I see them is that they only go in one direction. 
They've only gotten worse. Ne there's ne never been one where the, where, uh, the MPCC has said, uh, well, we made a mistake. Things aren't won't be quite as bad as we thought they'd be. <laughs> right. Um, so uh, I think uh, managed retreat and equitably ma managing retreat in certain areas are probably, um, we've, we've done an Oakland Park in, in um, Staten Island, but there are probably a couple of others. Uh, more dense areas, uh, I think we have to just fortify and, you know, uh, and build uh, uh, places, soft edges that can absorb, uh, you know, parks. I think, you know, as, as Michael said earlier, uh, parks are often uh, a great solution to sea level rise and, and uh, they absorb and are not, human life is not at risk. So I think we can and will build in certain areas, but we must build really s much smarter. The wedge guidelines, I think, uh, where people, are, developers are coming to us now to use uh, those wedge guidelines and uh, I think people are realizing it's a necessity, uh, and some in the private sector and also public sector. So um, uh, there it's, I, there I guess the question is it depends on the area and um, and that's where that, uh, you know, the, that deeper dive, 1620, that comprehensive plan for resiliency is, is, is really needed um, to, to supplement the comprehensive waterfront plan, not to, not to replace it. I, I agree, resiliency is one of the greatest challenges and, and at the risk of repetition or just throwing it out the window, I'm gonna repeat myself. But our waterfronts are only attractive when water quality allows, and that goes for aesthetic enjoyment and recreation to actually using it as, a, uh, as an industrial site. Um, and so cleaning up those waters, making sure that they are not dangerous for human contact, not dangerous having workers around, not dangerous for to have your family picnicking on the waterfront, um, that requires cleaning up the waters. Amen. And uh, I guess last thing, d d do you have a concern or do you share my concern with the, um, the, the, the life cycle of the plan not being in alignment with the administrations, with the terms? I actually, well, Due respect, I, I actually think of it as, as an opportunity, uh, as uh, you, you know better than I as a practitioner of the uh, political arts. But, uh, uh, you know, we have, we'll have a number of folks who want to be, um, uh, 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 there's a huge change, as you know, uh, in a number of people who are running for office. If uh, uh, we as civics and um, can use this opportunity to put together a progressive plan, this can become a, a litmus test or, right. a, or you know a baseline for which they can uh, uh, tell 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 us as uh, uh, the civic organizations and the, and the people of uh, city of New York, do you d do you think these are the best ideas and or if not, what are your better ideas? So I I view it uh, not not uh, giving uh, uh, the last administrations. This is where the public in, uh, involvement. Oh, I should also remember we will have one outreach session in Queens so far. So we. And we will have one in each borough um, with, with the outreach we're doing um, in partnership. So um, uh, if we do a good job about this outreach, get people involved, the 1,100 members of our alliance and many others that hopefully reach out to, to others, um, I think it becomes a, uh, um, a marker uh, for the next mayor or the, and the next uh, borough president, et cetera. Uh, well said. I think this, the ambition and the practicality and the strength of the ideas will carry forward and give us as, as um, advocates something to fight for, something to compare what's done, um, some, you know, a plan to compare against what actu the actions that are taken. Um, so we can push for the good ideas, we'll push for those, and the, if there are any bad ideas, hopefully not, uh, we'll fight against those. So mm -hmm. I think it'll be good to have a plan in place to give us a, a roadmap to compare what actually happens here. So we've been joined by uh, Councilman Ulrich. Do you have, do you have any questions? Or? Okay, thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Uh, the next panel, we have uh, Graham Birchall from the Downtown Boathouse, Luke Gayford from the Lilac Restoration Project, uh, Kath, I'm sorry, I can't read the handwriting, Catherine Hughes from FDNA. If you guys are all here, just come up.
Hi. Whenever you're ready, go ahead. Um, I am Graham Birchall. I am president of the Downtown Boathouse. We provide free kayaking in Lower Manhattan to approximately 30,000 people a year, more than 500,000 people since we began. Every year in New York City, approximately 100,000 people, or actually more than 100,000 people, go kayaking on the harbor, mostly for free. There is no other major city in the world where this is the case. It sounds like good news, but it's not good news in a city of more than 8 million people. Uh, there are issues of safe capacity. For example, I've got 200 boats in my boathouse, but I can only put 70 on the water because I can't get that more than that off the water if I need to for a security reason for a rapid change in climate uh, weather. So if I have a lightning storm, I need to be able to evacuate the harbor in less than five minutes, right? I mean, it's just the same with a security situation. Uh, this city can host a concert of half a million people in Central Park, but it can't put more than 500 people on the water that sounds surrounds Manhattan at the same time and get them off safely. So as we talk of building waterfront, uh, one of the issues I have about is waterfront access. When you talk about water access, which is a very different thing, in a city of millions of people, you have to build for size. If you build a vanity dock here or a vanity dock there, you are not really providing access. It's just a gimmick, right? As I, I could, uh, if you can find any, uh, if I had a beach, and there are no beaches in Manhattan, right? And there are none planned, at least none, no beaches that touch the water. The only beaches planned don't actually touch the water, which is not a beach, it's more of a sand pit. Uh, so, what I'm saying here is the city is leaving billions of dollars of economic and value and, and, and social value on the table every year because it is not enabling the residents of the city to use the harbor recreationally. Uh, if there are 100,000 kayakers, there ought to be, given the relative popularity of the two sports, approximately a million people going swimming in this harbor every year. Uh, as the riverkeeper pointed out, this, the harbor is actually clean enough to swim in most of the time, not all of the time. In other large urban cities which have similar harbors with similar situations regard to occasional pollution, like Copenhagen, Oslo, Sydney, you can go swimming in the harbor when it's clean. And there are iPhone apps you can get to know when it's not clean. But what happens in New York City is we simply don't allow swimming any time because it's occasionally dirty. And there ought to be, as I said, uh, you know, in a city of 8 million people on a nice summer day, there ought to be 100,000 people swimming in the harbor. It would be good for the people, but there's no access and there's no systems, and these are not expensive things to solve, but they're not happening, right? And so uh, as we plan for a city, it's always going to be an island city. It's always going to have enormous costs that competitive cities don't have because we're a, an archipelago of islands. Either we find a way to use the harbor recreationally, safely, for large numbers of residents, or we will always be at an economic disadvantage compared to those cities that don't have the physical challenges that we have. and and. I am not comfortable, I'm certainly not happy with the results of the last planning cycle, and I'm not comfortable going forward that this is going to change, that we are always going to be at a competitive disadvantage relative to other cities if, if we don't make much better use of our harbor. Um, somewhat off topic, but on topic, just uh, as a policy statement, uh, I don't believe well, I believe the only way to protect New York City from global warming is to stop global warming. You, you will not build a barrier to protect the city. The only place you could build a barrier is a breezy point. It's probably never going to happen. Get used to it. If you, there, you ha the city has to be resilient to flooding. I had four feet of water in my boathouse during Hurricane Sandy. I didn't lose anything because I had planned for that. The city has to do the same. But... You know, you could protect, you can build a barrier, but that doesn't protect Long Island, the Jersey Shore, or Bangladesh. There will still be hundreds of millions of people displaced if we have global warming. Our civilization will still be at threat if we have global warming. If the city is concerned about global warming, stop global warming everywhere.
Do not believe that you can mitigate it or be resilient to it because you can't. It's coming. Stop it or you're going to lose. I'm done. Thank you. Um, um, good afternoon, Chair Brennan and Council Member Ehrlich. Uh, my name is Catherine McVeigh Hughes. I served 20 years on Manhattan Community Board One. You're located in Manhattan Community Board One. Half of that time as chair or vice chair. Today I'm representing the Financial District Neighborhood Association known as FDNA. FIDI is home to roughly 50,000 residents and is the fourth largest business district in the country. As of yesterday, the text for T219-5328 was not available on the New York City website. <laughs> so I'll first focus on the status of the March 2011 Vision 2020 New York City Comprehensive Waterfront, a 10-year vision for the future of the city's 520 miles of shoreline for Reach 2, which is for Lower Manhattan. Um, so I've included a little map from the actual document. And then what needs to be included in the city's next 10-year vision to make sure that Lower Manhattan 20, uh, 20, 2011 plan is finally implemented and that our community is protected from sea level rise, storm surge, and extreme weather events. So on the second page of the document, I uh, copied what was to be completed in Lower Manhattan. So item the first item is the reach wide. It was about ferries and tour boats. Um, the boats still need to minimize their carbon footprint, noise, and wake. And earlier today at a Bloomberg uh, conference event co-hosted by Ceres, I learned that there is a technology you can actually put on boats. It's a new coat of paint, which you'd be putting on anyway, and it could increase energy efficiency. Uh, energy efficiency by 10% depending on where it is. So there are different things that you can actually look at as you know, echoing the importance to decreasing our carbon footprint. Okay, so if you go through the different points, such as the Brooklyn Bridge area, it's still being planned. Two, the Esplanade construction has not yet been begun between Pier 17 and Brooklyn Bridge. There's no educational use on Pier 15. 2A is still being planned. That's the new market building. 2B, Pier 17 is complete. The tin building is under construction. I would like to note that's private investment. 2C, um, Pier 16, no improvement or new infrastructure. 2D, uh, Pier 13, nothing done. Item three, bar uh, battery maritime building um, completed, 3A, construction in progress, 3B, um, the Coast Guard station, nothing done, 3C, Esplanade at the battery, nothing done, 3D, Pier A, completed, that was completed by the Battery Park City Authority, 4, Governor's Island, some development underway, 5, Statue of, Liber of Liberty in Ellis Island, um, working with the National Park Service to improve transportation access to destinations. Ticket vendors still are a serious problem down in the park in terms of safety. So, one year after the release of Vision 2020 and 2011, Superstorm in 2012, Superstorm Sandy devastated uh, New York City. Sandy caused 48 deaths in New York, 71 billion in the regional economic damage, with 19 billion in losses to New York City. Just for the record, two people drowned in Lower Manhattan here in CD1. The media impact only lasted only weeks. Major infrastructures, including transit, electrical, and telecommunications, sustained lasting damage, and some of which is still not fixed. The Financial District Seaport Climate Resilient Master Plan, which was announced in March 2019, just had its first meeting in October to kick off a two-year planning process with a conceptual timeline with no specific dates. Currently, the city's interim flood protection measures, IFMP, are only north of Wall Street, so the segment between Wall Street and the battery remains at risk. In conclusion, Sandy taught us the importance of preparation and investment to prepare for the worst potential impacts of global warming. A few things to remember. The future of the National Flood Insurance Program, NFIP, continues to be uncertain. We do not know if or how much the federal government will assist in rebuilding our communities after the next Sandy. 
Two, Moody's, a major credit rating agency, added climate to credit risks and warned cities to address their climate exposure or face rating downgrades. In addition, S&P ratings incorporate environmental sustainable governments guidelines and climate to the extent that affects an entity's ability to pay its debt. Cities that suffer downgrades will not only be able to make the investments, not only be able to make the investments they need, including the investments required to adapt to climate change and to recover from future storms. In 2018, global disasters totaled $160 billion. A third of that total 80 billion came from just four events in the United States. Um, climate change is a factor, says the insurance company Munich Re Report. Action items remaining for Vision 2020 and what needs to be included for Vision 2030. Complete the Vision 2020 goals that should have been completed by next year. Incorporate resiliency planning and implementation in the capital budget in the 2020 plan. Only funding for the study of the LMCR, Lower Manhattan Coastal Resiliency for the Financial District Seaport Climate Res Resilience Master Plan has been funded. The funding for the prior LMCR study was insufficient. Construct a multi-layered defense of local seawalls in a regional New York Harbor storm seagate system to address a future sea level rise and storm surges. A local perimeter of land-based seawalls will be necessary to provide protection from rising sea levels. However, a huge storm surges are best addressed by a layered defense system built around a regional storm surge seagate system that vastly shortens the coastline, here roughly 1,000 miles down to less than 10 miles, and provides comprehensive protection against the devastation caused by occasional, hard to predict, massive storm surges. The U.S. Army Corps is only at the beginning of a long process in its evaluation of the regional storm surge barrier. It's New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributaries Coastal Storm Risk Management Feasibility Studies includes natural and nature-based features, and examples such as tidal marsh, vegetated dune, oyster reef, and freshwater wetland. It is imperative to save the metropolitan region while maintaining a healthy Hudson and East River. It's actually a street, I'm sure you know that. Um, equitable uh, waterfront access and amenities, including CB1, the East, Water, East River waterfront immediately south of Brooklyn Bridge, continues to have an East River Esplanade in disrepair and only a thin strip of open space south of Pier 15 through the Battery. If there will be additional land added through the extension of the waterfront, open space needs to be created for the densest community in the country since dozens of sky skyscrapers were added since September 11, 2001. And most importantly, a sobering graph is at the bottom included in my testimony. Incorporate changing estimates of sea level rise in waterfront projects. So you can see what the IPCC had originally estimated and what NOAA estimates. So there's been a lot of new information coming out um, in the last 10 years. So thank you very much for the opportunity to, to testify. Thank you. Yeah, it's concerning because, um, you know, from our vantage and from what I'm hearing from folks in the outer boroughs, the other boroughs, um, you know, there, there's a sentiment that, that not enough is being done. But to hear, but, and we look to Lower Manhattan as where all the attention is being paid. So this is very uh, eye-opening. So um, it's very confusing. Um, there's the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project that stops at Montgomery Street. Right. And then there's the segment of north of Brooklyn Bridge going up to Montgomery. And then there's the Lower Manhattan Coastal Resiliency Project. So a lot of attention has been paid to that $1.45 billion project for that a little over two miles, but a lot of it still needs a lot of attention. So thank you very much thank for letting you. me share that with you because you are in a position to make a difference yeah, here. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name's Luke Gayford. I'm the operating uh, director of the museum ship Lilac, which is operated at Pier 25 in the Hudson River. Uh, I've been restoring ships for f uh, 35 years of my life. Uh, I've also served in the Royal Australian Navy as a diver. Uh, I've traveled all the way around the world to various different maritime ports, and I came to New York City 20 years ago. I also worked for the Department of Sanitation as a welder for the city of New York, and I am a part of the essential services that keeps this sitting running in, during emergencies. 
when everyone else goes home, I have to go out and keep the equipment maintained. One of the things I would like to uh, illustrate with this is, um, especially since last year where we had the snowstorm, where the whole tri-state area on the east coast was not prepared for, you, it was a massive illustration of how the gridlock and absolutely lack of planning can be used for the um, uh, street systems and highway systems in the, uh, the New York and its greater area. Uh, as illustrated during the events of 9-11, uh, the greatest maritime evacuation in the history of the world occurred during the months after 9-11. Not only were uh, all call of hands of vessels were made, and it was on a decision of people, not through like agencies or government agencies, but through the use of people of maritime background. And the problem we're having is the city of New York is giving up its maritime background access. All peers should have access for emergency services, for the use of bits and bites and ships tying off in states for emergencies, keeping waterways dredged and clear for the needs of an event that has occurred before and could occur again. That is my main point. Now, coming here to hear about the resilience of the city of New York, I'm a member and, uh, uh, of the Staten Island community. I actually went out and witnessed the flooding waters come through, uh, both down at South Beach, as I was driving my four-wheel drive truck, and I saw it uh, coming over the berm that the Parks Department had built on the beaches. I was, uh, by the time I got to my truck, it was already at my wheels. By the time I was getting down near the hospital, it was already up above my wheels, and I was telling people who were driving the other way, I think you should follow me. Uh, I then proceeded to follow the, the, the floodwaters coming along, uh, along where uh, Miller's launches had become flooded, which is now part of the uh, EDC redevelopment plan on Staten Island. Um, and I then followed the floodwaters all the way down to Richmond Terrace, where you could actually see where it came in various different waves, uh, depending on the, the, the topography of the marine waterfront. One of the things I did hear, uh, which was a question put together, which is a very good thing to consider, is number one, where industrial areas and uh, areas are opening up for redevelopment, is maybe reconsidering not developing on them at all. Because the, uh, the effects of global warming around the world is real. I've seen rising sea levels my whole career in the military. I've seen it here in the, na uh, in the uh, maritime front in, in New York Harbor as well. During periods of time of high, uh, high moon, sometimes the Staten Island Ferry cannot actually uh, discharge its passengers because they cannot lift the, um, the ferry gate heads, the bridge heads, sorry, up high enough to actually allow the Staten Island Ferry to dock. It is a reality. And I am a true believer that the solution is, that's what Greg said, is like unless you actually tackle the major problem, it's one of the things is to actually reconsider the development of the waterfront to actually reduce the amount of people that are going to be put at risk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Okay, this concludes uh, today's hearing. Thank you all so much.